Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number five, and I'm going to derive Ampere's law. I shall present two derivations, first an informal derivation and the second a formal derivation. In the previous videos to this, I discussed the Lorentz force, currents, and the continuity equation. In videos three and four, I calculated the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire. In video 3, it was for a straight line segment of finite length and later on I extended it to an infinite length. And in video 4, I discussed the magnetic field of a circular current loop and later a current loop of n turns, which we call a solenoid. So Ampere's law is one of the four Maxwell equations. And for this reason, it's very important, not just in the study of magnetostatics, but also in electrodynamics. However, the form of Ampere's law, which I present in this video, is incorrect in terms of electrodynamics and cannot be utilized. This is because it requires what's known as the Maxwell correction term. Without the Maxwell correction term, Ampere's law cannot be used and is invalid for electrodynamics. However, in this video, I'll present it without the Maxwell correction term, and this is the form of Ampere's law, which is valid only for magnetostatics. Before we continue, I'd just like to remind you of the magnetic field of a current carrying wire. Let's say we have a circular current carrying wire, a straight one, and it's going from it's going coming out of the page. What this means is that the magnetic field will look like the following. So let's say it's the current is flowing towards you, the viewer. So using the right hand rule, we know the magnetic field is going to circle or curl around the wire. And using the right hand rule, the direction will be like this. So we know, I suppose, intuitively, that the curl of the magnetic field is going to be non-zero. So what I'd like to do is, in actual fact, calculate the curl of the magnetic field. We begin with the magnetic field of a current carrying wire, where we evaluate the magnetic field at a distance d from the, the wire. That's where we place our detector. So we saw in video 3 that the magnetic field of a current carrying wire at a distance d from the wire itself is equal to mu zero times the current in the wire divided by twice pi times the distance to the detector. Like I said, I'm motivating this by saying I'd like to discuss the curl of the magnetic field. So before we continue, I'd like to remind you of the content of Stokes' theorem, which I've drawn on the right hand side of your screen. Stokes' theorem relates the curl, or the excuse me, the surface integral of a curl of vector field and the path integral of, uh, of the, the field itself, the dot product of the field with the infinitesimal line element. So this kind of motivates us to analyze the closed path integral of our vector field dot dl if we were to analyze the curl of the vector field. So what I'm going to do is calculate the closed path integral of b dot dl using the magnetic field for a current carrying wire, a straight current carrying wire. So what we get is written on the top left of your screen. We can take out uh, mu zero times i over twice pi d because they'll all be constants and we'll be integrating simply the closed loop of dl prime. Now we know of course that the magnetic field is nothing but a, a circle or it with loops we'll say around our, uh, our current carrying wire and as a result we'll be really only integrating along a circle. The radius of the circle will be d, the distance to the detector. And therefore, the closed path integral will just give us twice pi times d. Putting it together, we get the closed path integral of b dot dl as mu zero times i, mu zero being the permeability of free space, and i being the current in the wire. So what is of interest or important about this? The first thing is to note that we have a, uh, a form which is independent of the distance to the detector. So that's a bit odd. You measure the same value everywhere. But the reason is this, because as the magnetic field decreases, uh, it does so at the same rate that the circumference grows. So because we know that the magnetic field of a current carrying wire is, is uh, going to curl around the wire itself, it suggests that we should, in fact, integrate over cylindrical coordinates. So let's say, for example, we have the current on the z-axis. What I'm going to do is try and integrate the magnetic field using cylindrical coordinates. So the infinitesimal length segment in 
cylindrical coordinates is written as dl. I suppose it'll be dl prime is ds, and that's the s unit vector, that's radial, s times d phi, phi hat, and dz times uh, z hat. So look, that's reasonably straightforward. Uh, notice, by the way, that although you've written d as the, the radius, in cylindrical coordinates, d will be given the placeholder s. So on the top right of your screen then, I just have calculated or performed this integral, so with the close path integral of b dot dl prime in cylindrical coordinates. And what do we get? We get back mu zero times i, which we would expect. Why is this of interest? Well, the reason is because we can actually now generalize to any loop, an arbitrary loop will do, as long as it's closed. So you can do anything you like, provided it's closed, and you will get back the same answer. So it seems that it's not just a function of the, uh, the, the type of loop that you take. So it seems that if we have a single current carrying wire, then it will contribute mu zero times i to the closed path integral of b dot dl. So what happens if we have many loops? Well, it seems to suggest that each loop will contribute mu zero times i, but sub i if we want to say it that way. So that the total closed path integral of b dot dl, where we have many wires, is just going to be mu zero, the permeability of free space, outside of the sum of the currents. Or we could say it's mu zero times the current enclosed. And we call this Ampere's law. So this is the informal derivation of Ampere's law. Now, I'd just like to note, by the way, that the continuity equation allows us to write the current enclosed as the surface integral of j prime dot dA prime, where j prime is the volume current density. And you can see my previous videos, specifically number two in this regard. Using Stokes' theorem, we can move this to, uh, we can basically adjust this so that we have a surface integral up here and we have a surface integral down here. So we have two surface integrals which are going to be equal and I've written those at the bottom right of your screen. It should be pretty clear to you that the integrands are equal and this implies that the curl of the magnetic field is equal to mu zero j. This is the differential form of Ampere's law. And that's it really, that's the informal derivation. We know that the curl of the magnetic field is mu zero j. Or we could say the closed uh, path integral is mu zero i. I just have a couple of comments to make before we move to the formal derivation. Note of course that we integrated in cylindrical coordinates because of the shape of the magnetic field around the wire and I've indicated that in this particular illustration on the left hand side of your screen. So when we integrate this, if we, if everything is, uh, is done correctly, we can use symmetry arguments and we'll find that we're integrating mu zero i over twice pi and we'll be integrating d phi from an angle phi one to an angle phi two. And that will be our closed path integral of b dot dl. To visualize this, imagine that we have the wire placed at the origin here and we have the we have our arbitrary loop in orange. The extent of the loop at the edges of the loop will be given by two angles phi one and phi two. So that should make uh, reasonable sense to you. Now, what about the direction of the integration? What do we consider a positive direction, and what do we consider negative direction? Well, the answer to this is pretty straightforward. We use the right hand rule where you curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the current and your thumb perpendicular to that points in the direction of positive current. In this case, I2 is positive and I sub 1 is negative. And these will contribute to the total curl or the, uh, the total amount of current flowing through our loop. However, in this case, we can see that the third current, I sub 3 here, is outside the loop that we're integrating and of course doesn't count. So just before I move on, I'd like just to Note again, and I've said it on every video, that magnetism is caused by moving electric charges. Stationary electric charges generate electric fields. However, moving electric charges generate both electric and magnetic fields. So now what I'm going to do is move on to the formal derivation of Ampere's law, and we will also come across Gauss's law for magnetism, which some people call an unnamed law, but I'm going to call it Gauss's law for magnetism. So let's go. First of all, we're going to start with the Bo and Savart law for volume current densities. So we can look at video, or you can look at video number two in this section if you've not seen this in the past. 
Essentially what happens is we integrate, we have the constants mu zero over four pi, and we integrate the volume current density as a function of the prime coordinates, cross producted with the, uh, the separation unit vector, divided by the magnitude of the separation vector to be squared, and we integrate it, like I said, over the volume d tau prime. Now when we discussed volume current density, we saw that we could write the current as the surface integral of j dot dA. So you can look at video two if this doesn't make sense to you, but hopefully it does. Now, it's important here to notice what each of these is a function of in terms of the Cartesian coordinate system. And I've written it out explicitly here, whereby the magnetic field is a function of the unprimed coordinates x, y, and z. The current density, however, is a function of the source charges. Therefore, it's a function of the sources and it's given a function of the primed coordinates. And finally, the separation vector is a function both of the primed and unprimed coordinates, so both of the detector location and the source's locations. So what I'm going to do now is take the divergence of the magnetic field. So the mu zero over 4 pi is a constant which can easily come outside of the, the integration itself. So we take the divergence of the integral. Now if the vector field is well behaved, we can swap the order of the differentiation and the integration. So I bring the differential operator, the nabla, the, the nabla operator, inside of the integral sign, which is something that is permitted provided we have well-behaved vector fields. You should notice also, by the way, that we're, we're, about, we're going to bring this magnitude of the separation vector to be squared underneath the separation unit vector. That will be the next step. So at the moment, we're simply just taking the, the divergence of this particular vector field. Now, in my tutorials in vector calculus for electromagnetism, I derived all of the vector product rules. And one of those is written on the top right of your screen. So this is where we take the, uh, this, this is where we take the divergence of the curl of two vector, or the cross product of two fields. So in this case, we're going to be taking the, uh, the divergence of the cross product of the volume current density and the separation unit vector divided by its magnitude to be squared, or the magnitude of the vector to be squared. So I'm not going to go through the details here because I very much gone through them in a tedious manner when I discuss vector calculus for electromagnetism. So you can put the, uh, you can put the two of those together and we get the following answer. So we get the divergence of J prime crossed with the uh, magnitude of the separation unit, excuse me, the separation unit vector divided by the magnitude of the separation vector squared. And we get two terms. Now, oddly, both of these terms go to zero. Now, why do they go to zero? Well, the first term here, you can just accept from me that it goes to zero because when you do the curl, it, it just becomes zero. Um, and if you don't accept that, just do the curl yourself and you'll soon realize it goes to zero. So that one goes to zero. However, in this particular case here, notice that the Nabla operator is a function of the unprimed coordinates, where the volume current density is a function of the primed coordinates. So in this case, when we take the curl, it's going to give us a zero answer. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, or the closed surface integral of b dot dA is zero. We call this Gauss's law for magnetic fields. And of course, really what we're talking about here is magnetic flux. And this suggests that we have no magnetic sources, no magnetic charges, or in other words, no magnetic monopoles. Because remember, of our, remember back to our study of electrostatics, we found that the electrostatic field has non-zero uh, divergence, so the field looks something like this, let's say for a positive charge. And that means there is a non-zero flux through a surface, let's say a, a, a spherical surface. And that implied that we had, uh, we had electric charges. In this case, we don't have a divergence, and this implies that we do not have magnetic sources, charges, monopoles. And it is my understanding that uh, general relativity requires magnetic mono monopoles, but it's something which definitely hasn't been uh, sorted yet, and it is in many respects a source of embarrassment to uh, quantum electrodynamics. So this is a very important equation, and it's one of the it's one of the important equations for a study of magnetostatics. We're nearly finished, and now we're going to calculate Ampere's law in uh, a formal way. We're going to do this by calculating the curl of the magnetic field. Once again, we're going to calculate the curl of the BON of our law using the volume current density written on the top left of your screen. 
as I'm sure you can expect at this stage, we're going to invoke one of the vector product rules. And once again, you can check my videos on vector calculus for electromagnetism for a uh, derivation of this particular cross pro uh, this particular excuse me vector uh, vector product. So this is where we take the curl of a cross product between two vector fields A and B in this particular case. Now before we continue, let's note the continuity equation. It says the divergence of the volume current density is minus the time rate of change of the volume charge density. But for magnetostatics, where we have currents which have extended from from time began time began to uh, whenever whatever time you choose, there is no buildup of charge. If there's no buildup of charge, you can never have a time rate of change either, and that means the divergence of the uh, volume current density is zero. So the continuity equation is zero for magnetostatics. Now let's apply to the equation on the top left of your screen. The, the excuse me the vector product rule and we're going to get four terms and I've written a comment beside each of the four terms if you look at the last two if you look at the last two you note that we're going to be taking the nabla which is a function nabla operator is a function of the unprimed coordinates or the detector coordinates however both the volume current density and the separation vector are a function of the primed coordinates what this means is that when you take the divergences, all of those will go to zero. You can take it from me that if you perform the integration for this term, it's going to go to zero. So that's just a function of the actual integral itself. And what we're left with is a single term. We're left with the uh, dot product between the separation unit vector divided by the magnitude of the separation vector squared and the nabl operator outside of the volume current density. Before we can finish this, we need to note that in Vector Calculus for Electromagnetism video 41, I took the divergence of the uh, mag excuse me, the separation unit vector divided by the magnitude of the separation vector squared, and we found that equal to 4 pi times the three-dimensional direct delta function. Invoking this result to this particular equation down here, we are able to finish off Ampere's law. So you have that the curl of the magnetic field is mu0 over 4 pi outside of the volume integral, or we'll say the, the, we have our volume integral of j prime 4 pi times three dimensional Dirac delta function. And putting all of this together, what we find is that the closed line integral of b dot dl is mu0 times i enclosed. Of course, then we can invoke Stokes' theorem and we would get the uh, we would get back between each of these forms here. So the point is that the magnetic field has non-zero curl, whereas the electrostatic field has uh, has zero curl, and this is called Ampere's law without the Maxwell correction term. Remember, of course, that if the fingers of your right hand uh, are curled in the direction of the current, then your thumb perpendicular to your hand points in the direction of positive current. And this is Ampere's law. I think just for, I suppose, just for completeness, I'm going to, in actual fact, show you what the, the total term looks like when we include the Maxwell correction term. So just bear with me one moment. I'm going to do it in the differential form if I can find my cursor. So the differential form of Maxwell's, or Maxwell's equation, uh, Ampere's law, is as follows. We take the curl the magnetic field is equal to mu zero j plus mu zero epsilon zero and we have the time rate of change of the electric field. But for the moment we can say that this term here is irrelevant in our study of magnetostatics. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.